Okay, so good evening. Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first TSI public lecture of the 2023-2024 academic year. We're really excited to be back with our first public talk of the year, but there are also three others happening uh, this semester. So I don't know if you wanna take a photo of this slide. This is when all the other talks are gonna be happening. And if you have any questions, you can contact us at TSI dash outreach at physics.miguel.ca or you can follow us on Instagram or on Facebook. So before we get started, uh, this is our code of conduct. I will just leave it up for everyone to read it for a moment. All right, so of course, if anyone has any questions or needs any help throughout the evening, you can look for me or uh, one of the volunteers that you met outside when you came in. One more announcement is that don't forget to fill out our survey and win the brand new TSI mug. These are the first two ever TSI mugs <laughs> produced because we just went through um, uh, a rebrand with our with the Institute last year. So these are brand new mugs. Um, and with that, I am very happy to introduce Professor Adrian Liu, who's gonna be talking to us tonight about how we make maps of the cosmos to learn about our universe. So Adrian, take the All right, thank you. All right, so welcome, welcome to our first talk and I hope everyone's doing well tonight. How are you? Good. Okay, I'm going to talk about cosmic map making. Um, and the reason I'm gonna talk about that is because a lot of us, a lot of us cosmologists um, at the um, at the Trottier Space Institute and the McGill Department of Physics, we are map makers. Okay, so that includes uh, myself, uh, my colleague Professor John Sievers, uh, <laughs> Professor Cynthia Chang, uh, Professor Matt Dobbs. We are all map makers. Okay, so you might ask, why do we make maps? All right. Uh, and maps are kind of fun. You know, you can look at the various shapes that you get in maps, and sometimes it's kind of amusing, right? Uh, so you might have seen this before, right? The map of the state of Mississippi, um, and it kind of looks like Bart Simpson for some reason. Um, and if you ever forget where the state of Kentucky is in the United States, uh, you can use this little mnemonic. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you've got this step, um, and that's where uh, Kentucky is, all right? So this is all fun, but it's not why we make maps, okay? We make maps because it tells us about the dynamics of a place, how it operates and how it came to be, all right? Um, and that's true even if we look at a static map, all right? So here's an example that you're very, very familiar with, right? Just Google Maps, uh, Montreal. This is a static map. But even just looking at this without any animations, without movies or anything, um, we can learn things, right? So for example, I can stare at these um, networks of, of, of roads and highways, and that teaches me about how things move, how people commute to work and you know, go back home, right? Uh, we can ask about what the arteries of the city are, um, you know, places like Sherbrooke and so on. Uh, and indeed, if I were to overlay the traffic flows, that's exactly what you see, right? Um, see Sherbrooke lighting up red and, and so on and so forth. You can also learn about history from a map, about how a place grew to be the way it is, all right? So on the left here, I've got a, a map of Bangalore. This is a big city in India. Um, it's uh, a big techie city. Um, the Indian uh, Space Agency is headquartered um, in Bangalore. Um, and what you kind of see here is that Bangalore really with all its you know, curvy streets and all that, it really grew up 
you know, it, organically. It's a bit of a mess, right? In contrast, um, Chandigarh, uh, another city in India, was very much uh, a planned development. You can see the very, very regular blocks and the zoning. If you study this city, it's all each block has a has an equal mix of all different types of zones. So this these maps kind of tell you a little bit about the history. Right? Same thing for say Boston and Chicago. Boston uh, has a whole bunch of different curvy maps. You know, for, sorry, curvy roads. Um, it's a big mess. Um, Chicago, on the other hand. Um, had a big urban planning exercise in the in the early 1900s. Uh, there's the Burnham Plan, uh, which you know wasn't followed to the T, but it was very inspirational, and that's why Chicago has all these you know straight vertical and horizontal streets. You can get some hybrids. This is Barcelona, okay? um, and you can, for example, zoom in into this, the oldest, most historic portion of Barcelona. And this interesting polygonal kind of area that corresponds to what is basically the old fortress um, that defined the city for hundreds of years. Okay? Um, but eventually, you know, this city outgrew this weird shaped region. Um, um, and Serda, um, actually um, was an influential urban planner in the 1800s. He planned out these new areas where you see these very, very regular um, grids, okay? Um, and interestingly, also very wide avenues. Uh, cars weren't around back then, but um, he actually had the foresight to predict that eventually we'd have big vehicles that you know would need space to maneuver. You can also use a map to infer what isn't, what, you know, what you infer things that you don't see on the map. Okay. Um, so this is the map of Hong Kong. This is near and dear to my heart. This is where I'm from. Um, and so, for instance, here I'm showing you the major roads in Hong Kong. Um, and you can guess where things are, you know, mountainous and where it's hard to, you know, develop property, um, you know, where it's hard to put, you know, big straight roads and you'd probably guess that the mountains are where the roads become a little sparser right um indeed if i go to a topographic map you kind of were to switch back and forth between the two uh you kind of see that um the mountains are where the roads aren't right so i have inferred something about this place um even though the original map didn't actually have that topographic information Okay. Um, and you see politics in this. This is Hong Kong down here, uh, just north of the um, border to mainland China is Shenzhen, right? This is the world's largest continuously urbanized area. Uh, if you zoom in a little bit, it's a giant mega city. Okay, um, this was developed as a as a special economic zone in the late eighties, nineties. Um, and it's just this very regularly planned um, sprawling enterprise. Whereas Hong Kong, um, for better or for worse, is probably one of the most capitalistic places in, on earth. Um, and so you do get weird things like, uh, you know, uh, every inch of land that a developer can get their hands on becomes a high rise. That's one of the thinnest buildings in the world. Okay. So the point here is that by studying maps, I, I learn a lot about a place, okay? Now, this is not the only way to learn about our universe, all right? Um, so for instance, if you uh, uh, watch the news, um, they're typically not talking about the map of Montreal, which has pretty much stayed the same for a long time, right? They're talking about events like cars exploding and catching on fire, right? And so that's another way to do astronomy as well, right? So for instance, uh, Professor Vicky Caspi, um, uh, the director of our Trottier Space Institute, uh, she studies cosmic explosions called uh, fast radio bursts, these energetic bursts. And so she's reporting, she's a reporter. She's reporting on these uh, um, big events, okay? Uh, another great example, another one of my colleagues, Professor Daryl Haggard, who's here right now, um, Studies, for instance, among many things, uh, 
colliding neutron stars. She reports on car crashes in our universe. Right? So there are lots of ways to do astronomy. Um, but what I do is to study maps. Now, interestingly, um, a lot of the patterns that we see um, in our everyday maps are actually analogous to what we see in astrophysics, okay? So I'm gonna walk through a few examples now, um, but I wanna stress that most of these are just analogies, okay? Uh, I do not want to get into the habit that physicists, you know, in our arrogance sometimes get into where we make it seem like physics explains everything, which it definitely doesn't. You know, we have a tool that's applied to very specific systems. Uh, all these other things I'm gonna show you are really just analogies. All right, let's take another look at the, the Eastern Seaboard. Um, and here I'm showing you a map where I've got, uh, I've removed all the cities and I've removed uh, the, the labels and I've just left the highways, okay? So where are you going to look for the cities? Yeah. Highways. Where there's more highways, good. Um, do I care about uh, uh, whether it's a lot of highways in parallel or whether they're intersecting? Where they're merging, right? Yeah, so if I look in a random green patch, that's probably not gonna be anything. That's probably just gonna be the countryside, right? If I look just along a highway, that's probably a gas station and a McDonald's, okay? Where the cities are, are at the intersections. And you can kind of see this if I circle the intersections. Top one's Montreal, then I got Boston, New York, um, and Washington, DC, okay? Uh, here's a harder one, okay? There's one maybe you're a little less familiar with, right? Um, maybe a little closer to what our universe is like. Uh, so this is a map of China. Uh, and you can, you know, stare at this for a while. It's not easy, um, but the patterns are there. Um, and if I circle um, a bunch of cities um, to guide your eye, there's Beijing up there, um, you know, Wuhan and so on, Shanghai. And you really do see uh, a lot of um, things merging um, at these cities. In astrophysics, let's suppose I were to take a bunch of mass, right, in the early universe, and I were to just throw them on a computer and I just press go, okay? I understand how gravity works, so I'm just gonna put a bunch of mass in a box and let gravity pull things together. Uh, and what you end up with as time goes on is you end up with uh, what we call a cosmic web of filaments. Okay, and these, as you can imagine, oh, you don't have to imagine, you can see it. Um, it kind of looks like a, a network of highways and you can probably guess that where they intersect, those are the bustling metropolitan centers where we've got clusters of galaxies and lots of big giant galaxies, okay? Um, and we can zoom in into one of these and just as the highways are things that fuel our cities or you know, supply chains sending us food and all that, the same is true for these cosmic highways, for these cosmic filaments, where uh, gas, for instance, um, can flow in to the centers of these intersections um, and the gas can then uh, cool and form stars and form galaxies and so on, all right? So here's another view of uh, the cosmic web. This is a different simulation. And again, focusing in on one of the intersections, that's where the galaxy cluster cities are. But of course, with real observations, we don't have magic eyes that just magically let us see our galaxy, all the mass in the universe everywhere, right? Um, just like if you were to look at a, nighttime satellite photograph of say North America or something, you're only gonna see the city, all right? You don't see all the highways, you're only gonna see the beacons um, where the highways intersect. So similarly in astrophysics, where we mostly see these galaxies, okay? These dots. So I have to erase um, what's behind there if I wanna kind of 
uh, represent what we would actually see in a real observation, okay? Um, if I zoom out a little bit and replace this with some real data, this is an example map from what we call a galaxy survey, okay? where um, each dot is a different galaxy. Um, and what you kind of see here are just a whole bunch of very interesting patterns, okay? Um, for instance, um, if you what's especially prominent, if you look on the right side, is that you see structures where galaxies are kind of attracted to one another, okay? Um, and that's not surprising, right? We know gravity operates, gravity pulls galaxies together. So naively, we'd expect some sort of clustering, okay? Uh, Turning that around, what we can do is we can use the patterns here, see that use the clustering patterns we see to try to understand something about gravity and about our universe. Okay. So one question we often ask in cosmology is how far away from a galaxy am I likely to find another galaxy? All right. So let's say I'm sitting in the Milky Way galaxy, our home galaxy. Um, and, you know, how far, you know, if I travel a certain distance away, am I really likely to find the galaxy? Am I unlikely to find the galaxy? We can make a plot um, where we plot, you know, coming out a certain distance from the Milky Way, the chances of my finding another galaxy. And if we do it with data, it looks something like this, okay? Um, so there's some, a bunch of features here that, we, we understand, okay? Um, so for instance, uh, very close to a galaxy, there are lots of other galaxies around because of gravity, because they bring things together, okay? What's also interesting in cosmology is that there's a magic distance, okay? Um, known as the baryonic acoustic oscillation scale, okay? Where you're just this, extra likely to find the galaxy compared to normal, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go into the physics of that. That would be an, a whole entire talk. Uh, the only thing I will say about this point um, as, a, as a matter of pride here is that, um, so these data here are uh, basically, this is real data and these scientists measured this extra bump feature um, kind of around seven to 10 billion years after the Big Bang, right? So the universe is about 14 billion years old. Uh, uh, and they measured this around seven to 10 billion years. So it's a kind of an old universe. Uh, but your host for tonight, Hannah, um, in about an hour um, has a paper coming out where she's figured out a way to basically make this kind of measurement uh, just a billion years after the Big Bang. So if you're interested in how we can do something like this so far back, in our universe's history. Uh, talk to Hannah. But anyway, we can go back to cities. Um, here's a digitized uh, satellite photo um, of the US, okay? And we can ask exactly the same question. Um, if I'm in a city, how far away from the city center am I likely to find another city? And the really interesting thing is that, is that if you do make the exact same plot, you pretty much get exactly the same shape, okay? Um, this side of the plot is pretty intuitive, right? Like I'm fairly likely to find cities around other cities. In Montreal, for example, we got things on the South shore, you know, all around us and so on. So if you're in the city, you're probably gonna find another city close by. But interestingly, you also kind of get a little bump around kind of four or 500 kilometers. Um, this could be a coincidence, uh, but you know, I, I do think there's probably something real here. Uh, it's you know, to you know, being the sort of armchair, you know, urban planning geek, you know, 400 to 500 kilometers is roughly the distance between Boston and New York, or you know, uh, Montreal and Toronto is about 500 kilometers, right? So this might be saying something about how our cities operate, you know, in this, you know, eastern part of North America, where sort of roughly that far away, we kind of need another major metropolitan area uh, because of the way we live, perhaps. 
No idea if that's true, but it's interesting that there's also a similar bond. Zooming in a little bit, you know, instead of thinking about these galaxies as dots, let's see some other similarities when we look at an individual galaxy. All right, so here's a spiral galaxy. Um, and I can't resist showing you this amazing picture. Came out a few days ago, um, taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, where you really see all these lovely spiral arms. Um, and one question you might have is, what are these spiral arms? Okay. They're bright, they definitely have stars in them. But one thing you can ask is, are these rigid rotations like this, where you can imagine painting the galaxy on a disc uh, and you know you rotate around and it's just like a solid disc that's where everything's rotating around at the same rate. It turns out that's not what the spiral arms are, okay? Instead, they're actually more like traffic jams. So let's remind ourselves what a traffic jam looks like, okay? Now, a traffic jam is not a monolithic block of cars just rigidly moving forward, right? That's a military parade, not a traffic jam, right? Instead, a um, traffic jam is kind of a blob of cars that's slowly moving forward, but uh, cars can be at all sorts of different speeds, right? In the front of a traffic jam, people are zooming out. They're like, yippee, I'm out of the traffic jam. They're moving away at high speeds. And people coming in, you're, you're kind of slowing down and entering this traffic jam. And in between, you have people bobbing and weaving, causing all sorts of trouble and all sorts of different speeds as well. Okay. Uh, and so, in fact, the spiral arms are a little bit more like the picture on the right here. Uh, they're cosmic traffic jams we can see an individual star is actually moving at a different rate than the than how quickly the spiral alarms go around, right? You can see stars entering the traffic jam and other ones exiting and flying out at, at, at very high speeds, okay? Okay, so while there are a lot of similarities between the maps we make, you know, in our everyday lives and the maps that we make in cosmology, one big difference is that, uh, or the maps we make of our universe span much a much larger range of distance scales. Okay, uh, so to give you a sense for that, let's start at home. I've got the Earth, uh, and the Earth is a big place for humans, right? Eight thousand miles across in diameter. Um, it's a big place for humans but a very small place for light, okay? So something traveling at the cosmic speed limit, the speed of light, it only takes this thing, whatever it is, um, 43 milliseconds to cross the diameter of the Earth. So we would say the Earth has a diameter of 43 milli light seconds, okay? Now, if we zoom out a little bit, we've got the solar system. Now the solar system is obviously a lot bigger. Now you're talking 5 billion miles uh, and from the earth to some of the outer planets, you know, I kind of roughly picked a representative number, more like five light hours, okay? So it takes light at the cosmic speed limit, five hours to get from the sun to some of the outer planets. The sun's not the only star. We've got nearby stars. Uh, and the closest stars are maybe like four light years away. That's 25,000 billion miles to the nearest stars. Okay, so much, much bigger. And if you've ever been to the countryside, right, you know that there are more stars than I'm showing here, and we are part of the Milky Way galaxy, right? So you can imagine, say, a 10 to 100 um, billion stars uh, all orbiting a, a common center, okay? And now we're talking about half of a billion, billion miles across of 100,000 light years. So even light takes 100,000 years to cross this galaxy. This is when I first appreciated how big the universe is. Uh, so you can think about the Voyager spacecraft, okay? This was a, a spacecraft launched in the 1970s. Um, it slingshotted around a bunch of the planets, right? Taking really lovely photographs. Um, and then basically just kept going, 
okay? Um, and these are very, very, very fast moving spacecrafts, okay? Uh, so for comparison, if I had a bullet, okay? In 30 minutes, it can travel the distance between Montreal, Montreal and Toronto, okay? So bullets are pretty big, fast thing. In 30 minutes, Voyager travels about 30,000 kilometers, okay? So this series of uh, probes are very, very, very quick. And they've been traveling since the, the, the late 1970s. However, despite all this travel, they have yet to make their way out of the pixel that they started on in, in this graphic, okay? They're still on the same pixel. If I were to make this graphic and included Voyager, I wouldn't need to update it in decades. Okay. All right, so universe is a big place, but this is going to continue, right? The Milky Way is not the only galaxy. I already showed you maps of uh, you know millions of galaxies. So nearby, we've got the Andromeda galaxy. This is part of what we call the local group, right? Now we're talking 15 billion, billion miles um, or 2.5 million light years. 2.5 million years just for light to get from Andromeda to us. And you can imagine the story just continues, right? Just as we are, uh, you know, one of many solar systems that orbit uh, the center of the Milky Way, you have galaxies that are thousands of galaxies orbiting a common center in what we call uh, a galaxy cluster. Now, it turns out that we are not part of a galaxy cluster. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, galaxy clusters turn out to be very, very hot places. We'd be, you know, you know uh, irradiated in X-rays if we lived in a galaxy cluster. But we are part of something even larger, the Virgo supercluster, okay? So the Virgo supercluster is named after the Virgo cluster, one of these rich, uh, galaxy clusters of thousands of galaxies that I talked about. Um, you can think about us as not living downtown in the super Virgo supercluster, right? We're also not living, you know, way out in the country. We've got basically a nice suburban region uh, in the Milky Way galaxy, right? Um, and we are about 65 million light years from uh, the Virgo, the center of the Virgo cluster, okay? And just one more time, all of this, uh, one dot in this last slide, okay? So the universe is a big place. Now, the interesting thing about the fact that the universe is a big place is that the night sky is a time machine, okay? So light coming to us from four light years away, by definition, started traveling to us four years ago, okay? It is old light, okay? Um, I'm not seeing the way that thing you know, is today, but the way it was four years ago, something 4,000 light years away. I am seeing it the way it was 4,000 years ago. The Crab Nebula, this cosmic graveyard, um, its distance is such that um, we are seeing the way it was 6,500 years ago, okay? Uh, so if you were to somehow magically transport yourself right there today, uh, this graveyard would look something different. This is an outdated picture. Okay? Um, and similarly, uh, when we look at really, really distant galaxies, okay, things like the galaxies that my colleague uh, Professor Tracy Webb looks at, uh, these are very, very old galaxies, okay, uh, billions of years into the past. Okay? The moral of the story is that the farther away we look, the farther back in time we see, okay? I mean, you can also look at it diagrammatically. If this is us, if I'm looking out and trying to make a map of a part of the universe that's 10 light years away, that part, that map is gonna be out of date by 10 years. But go beyond that, 20 years, uh, like 20 light years away, that part of the map is gonna be 20 years out of date, 30, 40, 50. And if we make truly big maps of the universe, we have this really interesting thing where the stuff close to us is really up-to-date information and the stuff far away from us is really, really old. They're old pictures, okay? Uh, which is kind of the opposite of some of some many cities, right? Where the 
the center is often the old part of town, right? You're like Barcelona. Well, that's not quite the center, but uh, you know, you get the Mediterranean here, so that kind of makes it so you don't have this bottom half. Um, but a better example would be Beijing, where you know the center is the forbidden city and the kind of historic neighborhood, and the newer parts uh, are farther out in the outskirts. Unlike our maps of the universe, where the center is the recent part and the old stuff is farther out. Okay. Now this may seem a little weird to you, okay? Um, but the reason this seems weird to you is that we are so used to our smartphones and instantaneous communication, okay? So if I talked to someone hundreds of years ago, they, this would make perfect sense to them, okay? Here's an example. So we're gonna go back to the 1700s, okay? Um, it's uh, February 17th, 1778. Okay, and uh, the Americans are fighting the British in the American Revolutionary War, um, and things aren't going well for the Americans. Okay, uh, in fact, they are desperately, desperately looking uh, for an alliance with France. Okay, uh, and to that end, uh, they sent Benjamin Franklin over to France earlier, um, but they hadn't heard anything. Right. Uh, and Benjamin Franklin is this older, more chill guy. He likes parties and they're worried like, you know, like what if he's not actually negotiating? <laughs> um, so they say, okay, um, let's, let's, let's get someone really, really serious. But it's in John Adams there. And John Adams says, I, I got to go to France. Okay. So, uh, you know, they, they, they actually sail a boat up to Boston, pick him up um, and uh, go to Paris. And he arrives. Um, and maybe it's fitting that he arrived on April Fool's Day, because when he got there, Benjamin Franklin said, what? You know, we had an alliance in place in February 6th. That was 11 days before you left. Why did you come? And John Adams, you know, very, very logically said, look, it takes a month and a half for letters to cross the Atlantic. How could I possibly have known that you had negotiated this alliance? Okay. So one way we can think about this is to think about a map of John Adams' knowledge in mid-February 1778, okay? So if he were to, if you were to ask him about, you know, uh, the streets of Boston, his map would be really up to date, right? I mean, he's right there. He has current information uh, and his map is, you know, reflective of mid-February, 1776. But if you asked him about Northern Quebec, right, his map would only be up to date to January, 1778, right? Because that's how long it would take a messenger on a horse to get down from Northern Quebec, right? And pushing this even farther out, his knowledge of Paris at that point in time was only good to you know, early January 1778, right? So a map of John Adams's knowledge is you know very recent, close to where he is, and very out of date, far away, because of the of the very slow communication, uh, you know, uh, by messenger by letter back then. Just as compared to the vastness of our universe, even the speed of light is a slow method of communication. So this is basically our current state. We're like John Adams, okay? But this is actually a huge opportunity, okay? Because, and this is what makes my job as a cosmic historian so much easier than that of my colleagues who actually work in the Department of History, okay? They have to, you know, through indirect means, work out what, you know, uh, colonial America was like and uh, um, what imperial China was like. Because my maps are out of date if I look very far, if I do make these maps of faraway regions, I can actually see what the, the old universe actually looked like. I can actually see, you know, exactly you know, what the galaxies look like, you know, what the, what the stars are doing and so on, okay? Um, and so, let me see if I can do this. Yeah. Um, and so, 
what I am particularly interested in is the time when the first galaxies were forming, okay? Uh, here's a theory simulation of that. And what you're seeing aren't the galaxies, but instead you are seeing um, the galaxies polluting their environment. These galaxies are forming stars. They're ionizing the space between the galaxies, basically disrupting the neutral atoms between galaxies and these blue regions of these ionized bubbles that slowly grow and grow and grow until they basically polluted everything, okay? Um, and so uh, here's, here's some still pictures of that. Um, you can see at the beginning of this process when the first generation of galaxies were forming, I only have a little bit of pollution in these little pockets. Time goes on, I build these bigger and bigger uh, ionized bubbles and eventually I've polluted everything. And we would love to measure some of, make some of these maps, okay? Reach so, look so far away that we're reaching so far back in time, we are seeing the effects of the first galaxies. And the way we're gonna do that is with things like the hydrogen epic of reionization event. So this is a radio telescope in the South African Karoo Desert. Uh, you can see it's actually a whole bunch of radio dishes that together work as a super telescope to give you a more powerful telescope, okay? Um, I say Hera will be this. Um, it actually already looks like this. Um, we've actually built all the dishes. We just haven't, you know, plugged all of them in. Uh, and actually earlier this year to kind of plug extra things in and to help repair some of the ones that are a little broken, uh, we actually had two uh, members of the Trotty Space Institute, um, grad student Bobby Paspa and a postdoc um, Adelie Goss, who's sitting right there. Um, um, who went out there and can tell you all about their uh, adventures out in the desert. Okay. One of the really interesting things about HERA is that we can do very efficient surveys. So traditional surveys are in some ways a little inefficient. I showed you this earlier, where I am basically recording the location of each galaxy as a dot, painstakingly figuring out where they are, but for me as a cosmologist, I actually don't care about these individual dots, right? I care about the patterns that we see, that clustering stuff I, I talked about earlier. So a traditional survey is kind of like pointillism, right? Where you're kind of making a painting point by point by point, okay? What we are doing with Hera is to say, I don't care about these individual points. I care about this dog, yeah, this dog. <laughs> I can't tell from here if it's a dog or a cat. Um, uh, the star, uh, uh, whatever. Um, and so what I'm going to do instead is I am going to just average over coarse pixels and make coarse maps because that already um, tells me all the information I need to know. Okay. Um, and just to give you one small taste of the kinds of things I can learn from these maps, suppose I made you know one of these coarse maps, right? This is fairly coarse, like each one of these pixels is, is actually way larger than, than a galaxy. Uh, you know, by studying these shapes, we can actually learn about uh, the nature of these first galaxies by studying basically how they polluted the universe, okay? So again, it comes down to studying these maps. Here's a map of uh, pollution in the US. And if you were to zoom in, into these highly polluted areas, you would actually see patterns, okay? So one question we might ask is, is the pollution by the first galaxies like the pollution in LA County, okay? So I am a bit of a city snob. I don't think of LA as a real city, right? <laughs> I think of LA as a whole bunch of suburbs smushed together into something that doesn't really function as a city, okay? Um, so the LA version of pollution is to pay, take lots of little suburbs, all of which are, you know, polluting, right? And so you basically have, you know, the galaxy analogy would be to have lots of little galaxies, each polluting the intergalactic medium um, and forming small bubbles, okay? That could be how the universe operates when the first galaxies are forming, or it could be like New York, right? New York is more like a mega city. It's not just suburbs smushed together, right? 
And if the pollution by the first galaxies were more like New York, you'd have basically fewer of these pollution bubbles, right? But each one would be bigger. So this can teach us, for instance, whether the first generation of galaxies is dominated by lots of little guys or just a few big monsters. Okay. So in summary then, uh, you know, maps are incredibly useful in cosmology, right? It tells about the dynamics of a place, how it operates, and a lot of history as well, how it came to be. And that's why um, me and my colleagues uh, as cosmologists, we basically spend our careers trying to assemble some of the largest and most detailed maps of the universe, just so we can mine it all for information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adrian. So now we will move on to the Q&A period. So I'll have about 20 or 30 minutes of questions. So the floor wow. is yours. <laughs> Uh, the question about the uh, supercluster planet here, in that the uh, name is it? That uh, instructors? What are they? Yeah. So question. So um, let me let's say a little bit more about uh, what what superclusters are. Okay. Um, so I'm going to answer this question a little bit more generally. So a galaxy cluster. So no super yet. Right. As I said, it's, it's this collection of um, thousands of, of galaxies kind of orbiting this common center. So at this point, you can think about it as, you know, this cluster thing has, you know, uh, captured these galaxies. These galaxies are trapped, okay? A super cluster, you know, despite its name is, is actually something a little bit more abstract. Um, uh, with the super cluster, it's not that you have a whole bunch of galaxy clusters that attract to each other and are orbiting each other. It is just that um, they are starting to show signs of that, okay? So you can imagine that as I as try to use gravity in the, in the universe to assemble small things and then try to merge them together to assemble bigger things, superclusters are just starting to do that. Um, but at this point, all they are are a slight extra correlation where we're just starting to see the signs, but it's not really the sort of um, tight structure of this game. Well, I know that the JWST is like 400 times like bigger than the Hubble or 1500 times better. Um, but can it like take a photo of one whole galaxy at once, or should I have to take small images of them? Like sure. Um, so yeah, JWST in many ways is um is more powerful than Hubble, but uh, we do want to be careful. It's a few times bigger, okay. Um, and one thing I uh want to emphasize is that um uh. While it is newer, um, JWST does slightly different things. So JWST is mostly an infrared telescope, whereas Hubble is mostly an optical telescope, and they see slightly different things, okay? Um, uh, and so things that JWST are particularly good at are finding some of these earliest galaxies, um, and also for uh, studying planets um, in, the, in other solar systems. All right. So, for example, the, the guy who just did this behind you, that's my colleague, Professor McCowan, who's one of the experts uh, in our department on observing these uh, extrasolar planets. Now, about your question about, like, you know, like, do we have to patch together lots of pictures to get a galaxy? Um, it really depends on how far away the galaxy is, right? Farther away, the yeah, well, so the far away, the indeed, the less you have to patch up, but at some point, you know, you're so far away, it's just a dot, right? Um, so, you know, it, it goes both ways. You don't have to patch anything together, but you also just can't get that detail in the first place. It's just a blob of light, right? 
earlier file was the maps are at Hudson Road, indication of time. Uh, how do you see the, how the three dimensional nature of, of these maps as well? Or right now we're just focusing on the time aspect. Yeah, so they are inextricably linked, right? So um, let me put it this way. Um, if I wanted to make a three-dimensional map um, of our universe um, at the present time, or say, you know, a billion years ago or something, I cannot do that, right? Because the only way I can access the past is to look farther away, right? So basically, the only way, the only kind of map that I know how to make, that I can never make, is this really weird onion-like map, right? So this would be three-dimensional, where each of these circles is actually a sphere, a shell. Um, and oh, I should have brought my, I have a set of nested Russian dolls that are circles. It basically looks like that, right? Um, where I've got layers of different, it'd be like if you were peeling an onion and each layer were like a different age. Yeah. It's also linked to uh, since we only have at one point of view from the Earth going outwards. Like, you know, that's why we can't map it. Like we're more like on each end of the gra from human gravity, but uh, also like even if we have like two telescopes around the Earth, the distance might not be enough to map it. In Haiti, I guess. It, 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 right. So 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 good. So what you're basically saying is okay, but like if I one mouse show here. Anyway, um, let's say I wanted to look at, let's say the purple ring is 10 years old, right? And you're like, but I really want to look at that part of the universe um, that, you know, uh, uh, you know, but it's, uh, but today, right? Like I could do that if I magically live, you know, 10 light years to the right, right? But I cannot do that. And like you said, you know, going, you know, putting satellites in orbit and all that, even that, that's a tiny distance compared to, to any of this, right? This actually, you know, um, uh, is, an, is a really interesting uh, phenomenon uh, related to something we call uh, a cosmic variance. Um, so there's an interesting thing here where basically I have one onion to look at, right? This is the unit, this is the big map that I'm stuck with. If in say uh, a lab science, if I don't like the data I'm looking at, I can just do more experiments, right? And I can, um, you know, get more onions, average my, my results together, average down my errors, um, but I can't do that with, with the universe, right? So, uh, there's an intrinsic uncertainty in in the in using uh, cosmology to probe uh, the fundamental nature of our universe. I remember I was I saw the unit entities back earlier, so um, I mean, it's, I, I was not very close to the internet public conference. So mm -hmm. if you like expand a bit on how that works. Okay. All right. So um, the um, the MPC per H, so the MPC I'm not going to focus on, right? That's just millions of parsecs, and there's a technical def definition of parsec, but you can just think about it as 3.26 light years. Um, now, MPC per H. So this has to do with the fact that um, uh, our universe is expanding, and we uh, describe it, we describe this expansion rate um, using uh, what we call uh, the Hubble parameter. Um, and in certain units, that's what the little h is, okay? So what does MPC per h tell us? The fact that we're using these funny units, what it tells us is that the way we measure distances in our universe is inextricably linked to the fact that the universe is expanding, okay? And, the, and so then the question is, why is that? And that's because what we do is we uh, we measure Doppler shifts, right? So I look at light from a galaxy, and I can use you know how much it, its wavelength has been stretched out to figure out how quickly um, or not it's it's moving away from me. Okay, and the way that's useful 
is because the expansion of the universe is the expansion of space itself. So if um, there's twice as much space between me and an object, then it's gonna expand twice as quickly away from me because every little bit of space is stretching. Uh, so then velocities become a proxy for distances. And that's why the expansion of the universe, which could causing these velocities is tied up in every single distance measure we, uh, we use in our universe. Yeah, there. So I had a curiosity of the, the redshift mapping. So you can measure how, how could you use this to measure uh, the dark matter, for example? Dark Good. Uh, so there are uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of ways to uh, talk about dark matter. Um, so funnily enough, um, so, so I'll, 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 I'll say a bunch of things, okay? Um, so for people who uh, maybe aren't as familiar with this, dark matter is a significant component of the mass of our universe, uh, but for some reason, it doesn't interact with light at all, okay? Um, as far as we can tell so far, we've only kind of felt its effects through gravity, okay? Um, so how do you, um, for instance, uh, know about the, the existence of dark matter? Um, so there are several ways, okay? Um, one of the, and I'll focus on one way um, that uh, is focused on making maps. So you might've heard of the cosmic microwave background. This is a map of the oldest light in our universe. Okay, this is, if you like, sometimes people call it the leftover light from the Big Bang, whatever that means, okay? Um, and we study these um, patterns in the cosmic microwave background. Um, and what we find is that the, um, the light in the early universe isn't uniform, okay? Um, and what that tells us is that the distribution of stuff in the early universe also isn't uniform. And why is that? Again, it's because of gravity, right? It's stuff pulling stuff together. So then I get clumps of matter rather than having everything screwed like a jam, right? Um, and how much, you know, clumpiness there is, uh, if, you if you don't assume that there's dark matter, you get that wrong. So funnily enough, some of our best evidence from dark matter, again, comes from studying maps. There, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so there's also, so um, I guess your, your first question is basically to uh, asking for a sense of scale. Um, and so um, the, the distance between us and the um, and the farthest away thing we can see, okay. Uh, so basically, the outermost ring here, if you like, uh, is about forty six billion uh, parsecs. So forty six billion times three point two six light years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so okay, good. And then so that gives you a sense of scale. Um, and now. Um, we can ask, okay, so I look at different distances away and I'm seeing different parts of the universe's history. Um, what are interesting ethics? And uh, the word interesting is a very loaded thing, right? It depends on who you ask, whom you ask, right? So one of the most distant things, basically 46 billion times 3.26 light years away, um, the cosmic arc of a background, that is super interesting right now because um, people, uh, are analyzing these maps in detail to see if, for example, there are gravitational waves present in the early universe at the right level and with the right properties, right? So you um, imagine that uh, uh, you might've heard of things like LIGO, you know, what ripples of space-time, you know, emanating from violent events like neutron stars crashing into one another. The early universe potentially might also have produced a background of ripples, okay? 
that's one thing people are really interested in. And then you have people like me who are really interested in a little later, maybe a billion years after the Big Bang, uh, cosmic on. How did the first stars and galaxies form? You know, how did they affect their surroundings? Right. So, you know, how, how did the toddler universe um, look like? Right. Then you get people who 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 look even for you know closer in, into the present, right? Uh, and there are people who are really interested in star formation. There's something called co not cosmic dawn, but cosmic noon. Right? Uh, and cosmic noon, uh, that's the peak of star formation. The, the, that's when the universe is most actively making stars out of gas clouds. That's interesting too. That's part of the the story of galaxy formation. And then you have a lot of people also studying the very close by universe, the way it is today to complete, you know, to anchor the story of galaxy formation and cosmology. Um, and that is, you know, on the cosmological side, that's also interesting because right now the universe's expansion is accelerating and nobody knows why, okay? Uh, so basically, um, I didn't properly answer your question because I said all of the above. Right. It's all <laughs> of the above. Um, like with regards to the universe expanding and mapping farther and farther out, is the expansion like an issue for our current technology, or are we able to keep up with the expansion and, and look for that far away? Yeah, you know, the, that, that's a that, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so um, it's not um, a matter of technology. Okay, um, so it is uh, a matter of basically the expansion rate. Okay, um, so it's not, you know, this is not an issue, right? I, I don't worry about, um, uh, currently at least, I don't worry about uh, the universe expanding so quickly that basically light can't catch up with us, right? That, that would be the, um, that would be the concern, right? Where you're saying like, okay, uh, it's sort of like a treadmill. If the treadmill is going too quickly that way and I can't run that quickly, um, I'm, I'm never going to make up the distance. Um, so that scenario is what we would call a superluminal expansion. Okay. Um, that is not what's happening right now. Okay. Um, however, um, that uh, depending on uh, what theory of the very early universe you believe in, okay, uh, there's a possibility. Um, that that actually did happen um, in, in our early universe. Um, and then you actually do get situations where you have uh, um, basically um, almost like island universes um, that can't really see each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed this statistic that the universe is like yeah. Around and instead of like one star, two or three. Yeah. Like, does this affect mapping and like the depth? Is it accounted for? In it? Yes, that, that's a great question. In fact, I would say it's more than accounted for. We often use this as a tool. We have to account for this when we do these maps. Um, and remember the thing I said earlier about Hannah figuring out a way um, to um, map the. Uh, this baryon acoustic oscillation scale in the very early universe, um, what she is doing is using that bending of light to her advantage to be able to make such a measurement. So yes, we have to take that into account. And in fact, it's a very important tool. Uh, you mentioned that Hera will be uh, live in, under construction right now. When are you expecting it to be up and running? And what are you hoping to see? Uh, so um, I don't know. Um, the, the 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 real the real answer to um, when I hope it'll be up, all fully up and running is that is uh, three years ago. Um, <laughs> and uh, but you know like. COVID had other ideas, right? Like not being able to travel to South Africa was, you know, a huge problem if you're trying to build something in South Africa. Um, so, but the lovely thing about not building one giant monolithic telescope, but instead building a super telescope made up of lots of little telescopes is that even before you finish building everything, 
you've already got a perfectly functioning telescope, right? It just isn't as powerful. So we've actually already been using Hera. Um, we have already been able to make statements about the nature of the first galaxies. Um, and um, to, to kind of summarize it briefly, um, we are finding that uh, the first generation of galaxies probably um, had stronger emission of X-rays than, than today's galaxies, okay? So we're hoping to you know, finish building this and get a really great season of data from ERA this year. Uh, but uh, yeah, even without finishing the, the whole job, we have already got an incredibly powerful telescope. <laughs> I have time for one more question. Oh no, I scared them away. <laughs> okay, let's say there's two. There's there two <laughs> more questions. Okay, if not, let's. Oh. Yeah. Uh, can your maps tell us anything about the future of the universe and what am I doing? Okay, um, so it depends on what you mean by, uh, you know, uh, can our maps tell us about the future of the universe? So obviously I, you know, can't invoke magic, right? And I, can't, I cannot magically actually produce a picture of what the future looks like. But what I can do is to use these maps mapping out the past and the present of the universe to understand you know our universe and the theories governing our universe so well that i can basically predict the future evolution of of the universe right so in that sense um it's it, it's a little bit like uh what we do in the rest of physics right like you um in physics you can uh understand the dynamics of a bouncing ball with Newton's laws well enough that if I told you, okay, I'm about to launch a ball off this table, you can tell me with very, very high uh, precision and accuracy what it's gonna do. And so by learning about our universe in such fantastic detail, testing our theories and confirming them, we can then extrapolate and say, okay, probably what will happen is that our universe will do this in the future. So what's going to happen? <laughs> I don't know. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Still, still large uncertainties. Yeah. Hi, um, I was reading recently about like James and Tom Trump and like how the start of which might be the best way to study the early universe. Yeah. Um, so I remember I was reading on how some of the galaxies that now in the early universe were bigger than they like, previously theorized. Huh? Um, so like how, like just overall, how do you think like um, James Webb telescope will be, will be like changing your like the mass of the universe that you're making. What kind of theories you think you like you have for the universe? How do you anticipate the change? Okay. Um. Good. So um, I will first say that um, uh, I think the jury's still out on those. I, I I know what you're you're talking about here. Um, where you know, these big massive galaxies seem to appear early on, right? Um, more than we might think. Uh, the jury's still out as to whether there's really interesting, subtle new physics associated with that. It's, um, depending on whom you ask, um, there are still perfectly good mundane explanations for that. But more generally, um, what I am very much looking forward to is, um, the fact that here I'm talking about making a picture of the um, uh, the pollution of the first galaxies, right? Um, and um, what would be nice if, is if in addition to the pollution, I could also give you a few examples of the galaxies doing the pollution, right? Um, and so uh, in fact, sitting diving back from you is Franco who, uh, uh, is uh, a researcher working on like if we had the galaxies as well as these pollution maps, what we could do. And then you have the source and the result, and that's a very powerful combination. All right, let's thank Adrian again. All right.
So we just have a few quick announcements and then we're done. So the first one is that we have another outreach event coming up in a few, no, in like one 